Thank you. A lot of people come up to me and say they feel sorry for me because I'm in a wheelchair. I say, don't feel sorry for me. At least I am not ugly. Some people think I had to point. That, that was funny. You can't laugh, but I promise you. Some people think I had a muscular dystrophy. Other people think I had to find a bifida. And still other people think I got hit by a truck. I don't have any of that. All I have is dyslexia. Okay, John, I thought that was funny. <laughs> they did not think I, that, 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 that was funny. You can laugh. Well, I do have this cerebral palsy, which means it's hard for me to control my muscles sometimes. Like, like I cannot write my name, but I can drive a car. Pretty scary, huh? So, um, man, it is great to be here at Faith Generation, and I, I truly feel at home. A year and a half ago, I moved from San Diego over to Cape Coral. And, and I've been in full-time ministry for over 30 years, uh, traveling. And, uh, during those 30 years, I helped start two churches. And both the churches met in a community center. In fact, the church I have studied in San Diego was almost exactly like this. The cinder brick block lobby, the Coke machine in the lobby, the ice cream freezer in the lobby. Man, when I walk in here today, I feel like I'm, I'm at home. But let me tell you something. God will reward your faithfulness because both the churches that I helped start are now meeting in their own building. So, you know, that's encouraging. I know it's a, it's a lot of effort and time. And, you know, it takes a lot of work. You know, I, I showed up here at 9 a.m. this morning and everything was already set up. So you guys have an amazing setup team, and just God will reward your faithfulness, let me tell you. Like I said, a year and a half ago, I moved to Cape Coral, and you know how gracious and merciful your pastor is, right? So I, I started telling him this story. Back in 2003, this 2006, I was on a pastoral staff at a church near Miami in West Hollywood. And during those three years, they had four hurricanes. Remember Katrina, Charlie, Jean, and some other name. No big deal in Florida. They were all like category one. And, and so, so, for the three years I lived in Miami, they had four hurricanes. As soon as I leave Miami, no more hurricanes, right? <laughs> so I moved here. And right after I moved here, and like I said, I moved to Cape Coral, we had one of the world's biggest hurricanes of all time. It's like, are you kidding me? But it gets better than that. In August, I went back to San Diego to, to preach at a church and, and to do a, a, youth, um, a, a youth camp out there. The weekend I went out there, I'm sitting at dinner with the pastor on Saturday night. And everybody got an alert on their phone. 
and, and the governor had declared a state of emergency because of Hurricane Hillary. The first hurricane ever to hit California, you know what I mean? <laughs> but get this, when I read the alert, it said this, San Diego could experience winds up to 36 miles an hour. Ooh, wow. And they could get up to 1.6 inches of rain. I know. Ooh. So I told John, I said, John, hurricanes keep on following me around. And John, because he's merciful and, and, and just caring, he said, Scott, you need to move out of Florida, okay? <laughs> but I'm here, and, and like John said, I'm, I travel around, I, and I speak all over the world, and right now, I, I, you know, I came here to work for four kids, which is a foster agency, and if you want to know more, like I said, I will be in the lobby afterwards. I have great people that came in to help me. John and Julie is the back. Why do you sit in the back row? You're my friend, and they sit in the back row. That that's how people love me. Okay, but but they're amazing people. They're foster and adoptive parents of six children, so, so come and stop by. We have all kinds of opportunities. You can help right here in our own backyard. As you can tell, I, I love having fun with people. I love laughing with people. And, and I remember one day, I was in a park, and I was sitting in my wheelchair, and it, Two elderly women come walking by, and they stopped, and they stared at me, and they stared at me, and they stared at me, and finally I didn't know what to do, so I stood up and I started walking towards them, and I said, I was healed! Thank you, you clap. You never saw two old ladies run so fast in all your life. John, you missed the whole joke. That's okay. Yeah, you know. If, if you stay in here, you might get saved. So, you know, um, 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 so, so, um, People all the time say, Scott, you have such a good attitude about life. You can laugh at yourself. You can laugh at your situation. You are so positive about life. Why? Why are you so positive about life? One, one reason why what I learned is I need to become powerless. I need to become powerless. Right now, I'm going to share with you my life verse. And I'm going to break it down to show how each and every one of us can enjoy life no matter what life may bring us, no matter what type of hurricanes, no matter what type of circumstances. My life was found in 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 9. It says, But he said to me, By grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, 
so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I deny in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The first thing we need to do, we need to accept. We need to accept look, the verse that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We need to accept that we may have weaknesses in our lives. If I tell you my life story, I. I can't control that I'm in a wheelchair. I was just born this way. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my mom's fault. It wasn't the doctor's fault. It just happened. If I look back upon my life, I grew up in a divorced home. If I look back upon my life, my, my mom committed suicide. If I look back about my life, but the hardships, and so that, that when we get into trouble, human nature, we want to control everything, right? We want to control our happiness. We want to choose every road to make us happy. Whoever chose the hard road? If we have a true choice, if we always choose the easy road. And, and, and when life is hard, when life is difficult, when things are going our way, we lose our way. Man, I just want to be happy. I just want to be satisfied. I just want to control my environment. And sometimes we cannot do it. When we go to the doctors and the doctors that tell us something is wrong with us physically, we need to accept sometimes we are powerless, that we are weak. I'm going, and with our foster kids, and I'm trying, you don't know how God has weaved together t today. Because you saw the, the orphanage in El Salvador. I'm here with four kids, and this is nationally known as Stan Sunday where churches all around the country stand up for orphanages around the world, for foster care here in the United States. It's amazing how God orchestrated that. But when we take in our, and, and, and I have foster adoptive kids, and when you take in these kids, you know, Fall of his own that he was way, he was raised in an orphanage in, in El Salvador. With my kids, you know, it's not their fault that their moms and dad were on drugs and abusive. And we want to control their environment, and we can't control that. We need to accept that we don't have control of everything in our lives, but that when we get into trouble, right, when our marriages are on the road and we don't feel satisfied in our marriage, we start flirting with that coworker. We start going down to the neighbor's house. Because we want to control our happiness. And when we're not happy in this environment, 
people go outside the God's plan to try to control it. When we're in depression, when things are going our way, when we lose our job, oftentimes many people try to go to pain by using drugs and alcohol. Because we don't accept the fact that sometimes life can be difficult. Life can be hard. And I want to weave a story into this sermon that is deep and what I had to learn in my life. I did not get married until I was 37 years old and it wasn't for the lack of trying, let me tell you. I went to Bible college, and let me give you a window in the Bible college in the ministry. The ideal thing is to go to Bible college, to meet your mate, to get married right after graduation, to start a church, or to, to work at a church, and live your happy life. That's how ideally it supposed to work. But here I was, I did not meet anybody in college. Here I was, I was out preaching for my friends, I was going with my friends, I was teaching at my friends at church, and they were getting married, they were having kids, and here I was, I have no one. And I really wanted somebody really bad. But partly it's because I'm in a wheelchair. Let faith the fact. It, it'd be hard to spend the rest of your life with a guy in a wheelchair. Well, I was working at that church in Miami. I was on the pastoral staff, and I was in charge of the singles on staff at our church. And I told God by then, I said, you know, I accept that I'm single. I, I'm fine with that. And if you want me to get married, you need to send a person in my path because I'm not going to go out and try to find somebody. And besides that, I was a, the single to pastor, right? I did not want to be that creepy single to pastor to every, every single woman that came into our church. Hey, how are you? Do you have a boyfriend? That's not how you build a single to ministry, okay? But one, one, one day, a woman comes walking in. We start talking. Eventually, we started dating. And she was the first woman ever in my life, other than my mom, to say, I love you. Oh man, I was so happy. And at 18, I moved away from my dad and stepmom, went to college, did my own life, but I always wanted to honor them. And they said, Scott, whenever you find a woman that you're going to get married, would you do us the honor? We want to meet her first before you get married. So I honor them. So one Christmas, about a year after we started the date, I took her back to my parents' house in San Diego for a two-week vacation and to introduce this woman that I wanted to marry. And 
I started talking to my parents and they were mad at me because they said, Scott, you're already engaged. I said, no, we're not. But the way she was talking about me, they thought we were engaged. Now, sir, if a woman was talking to their parents like that, would you, like, yeah, I am in, no problem, I got this. Two days after we get back, she comes into my office and says, Scott, I cannot date you anymore. I go, why? She says, Scott, I can't deal with your disability. And I said, one, I was disabled when we met. Number two, you owe me $500 because I did take you to San Diego. Give me my money back. But really, we broke up and I was heartbroken. God, why would you do this? You brought her into my life. Here I was uh, traveling the world preaching about the happiness of God, but on the inside I was torn up. God, why would you do this to me? And through counseling, through reading the Bible, through good friends, I started searching my heart. Hear what was happening. When I, when, I, when I started dating a woman, my personality would change because I know it was difficult to, to, to date somebody, to marry somebody with a disability. So when I got into that relationship, I started becoming a doormat. I did not have an opinion. I did not have, I did not value myself because I wanted to protect the relationship so bad that, that I let the woman have whatever she wants. I did not stand up for myself anymore because I didn't want that conflict and I didn't want her to break up with me. Guys, women don't like, or girl, guys, women don't like doormat until you get married. <laughs> After you get married, it's a different story, okay? Am I right? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah. Mm. But I wasn't accepting myself. I wasn't accepting who God made me truly. I was changing to fit somebody else. But we need to accept. And when, we, when I deal with my foster kids, I need them to learn how to accept their circumstances. Because nothing they can do can change where they are right now. But not only acceptance, number two, the embrace. The embrace. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ and power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, <coughs> I delight, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecution and difficulty. And I, and I, it's the one thing to accept. And when I say accept, I say this is the ER, ER mentality, right? Oh yeah, life is horrible, but I'm going to keep on going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the embrace, 
I would delight in insults. I would delight in weaknesses and hardships. I would delight. I would be happy. I would be satisfied. That one step beyond. Can we embrace who God has made us to be? Can we embrace our environment? Can we embrace everything going around us? That doesn't mean that we should be gleeful about it, but we delight because we know that God is working something special in our lives. Because in James 1, 2, through 4, it says this, Consider it joy, my brothers, and whenever you face the trials of many kinds, be happy, be satisfied, because God is working something special in your life. People don't come in, don't call me and ask me to travel and preach because I just accept what God, but I'm happy about it. I'm happy that I'm in a wheelchair. Because I know God is going to use me in a very special way. In, in, in James, it says God is molding you. God is conforming you. We did our, our, it's hard to embrace. It's hard to embrace. Sometimes what happens to our kids in foster care. About a year and a half ago, there was a child brought into a four kids home two months old, that had 17 broken bones. How can you accept, how can you embrace that? Let me bring it closer to home. Let me bring it here to Southwest Florida. There was a foster care event, and then this woman in her 50s holding a, almost a newborn baby. And she was approached, hey, we see you have a new foster baby. She goes, no, this is my foster child baby. And my foster child is 11 years old. Right here from Southwest Florida, she was off of the sex traffic. How do you embrace that? How do you delight in that? How do you delight in that weakness? Very difficult. That's why I have four kids and we believe in a child for every home, but not only that, we believe a Christian home for every child. Because the only way you can embrace something like that is, is to introduce Christ to that family. And knowing that I don't know everything, I don't know how God will do it, but God will be glorified through it. Just like God glorifies himself through me, through my difficulty, through my circumstances. Back to my story. After I, I, I dealt with who I was, I started dating again about a year later. And 
I was living back in Boston at that time, and, and Boston, not known for, for, for Christians everywhere, right? They're not a church on every corner. So back in 2006, I decided to go on eHarmony. Now, this is before everybody dated online, right? Back in 2006, it was still kind of creepy, okay? But nowadays, everybody date online. Swipe right, swipe left, swipe up, swipe down. Don't know what, I know you're looking at me, not you, right? So, so. I, I, I met this woman through eHarmony. And before we met, we were still emailing. This is even, I'm, if you're under 30, this is even before texting. This is how life was before texting. You still email people, okay? Kind of weird. We were emailing back and forth. <clears throat> I said, before we meet, can I direct you to, and this, this was even before everything was on YouTube. Before there was YouTube, I know I'm dating myself, but I I I told Sarah, hey, go and watch me. I I just preach at Liberty University. Go watch me at their convocation. If you still want to meet after you hear me, let me. If you don't like who I am, I understand. But I'm on eHarmony and I mean business, okay? Put up or shut up, you know? <laughs> I'm not here for another friend. I have enough friends. So she goes, okay, we meet. And we got married a year and a half later. Because I learned to embrace who I was. And finally, the oxymoron. Let's break it down. Oxy, that, that root root, oxy means keen or, or smart. The term moron means moron. <laughs> so you have a keen, dumb person, a smart, idiotic event. How can they go together? For when I am weak, then I am strong. The only way I can survive, the only way I can do it is to have Christ power flow through me. I am the strongest person in the world, even though I'm weak, because of God's power through me. That's how I can do it. Back to my story real quick. That woman that dumped me she called me a couple months after I started dating my, my eventual wife. And she's crying, oh, I'm sorry, Scott, I'm sorry, what I did to you, I'm sorry, could you take me back? Being the spiritual, mature person, a pastor, I started laughing. <laughs> you missed the train, baby. <laughs> I, 
No, Brady, I, I, I say, you know what? Uh, we can learn, learn from the hurt. We can learn from the pain. And I have learned, moved on. I encourage you to do it. Several years later, I heard that woman that I dated that I thought God brought into my life. She never been married before I met her. In seven years, she had been married five times. Does God know what he's doing or do I know what I'm doing? Is God strong or am I strong? And that that we encourage all of our foster kids. You may be in a weak circumstance, but God's power working through you will make you strong. Now, now, let me show you. Let me show you what happens when you allow God's power to work through your weakness. Look at my family now. We have fostered and adopted four kids. And we're great about that all four of them have received Christ. Three out of the four so far has gotten baptized. Why? Because of God's power makes us strong. Here I am traveling the world, talking to people. Here I am with a family. When I listen to myself on YouTube, I can't understand myself. But with God's power, look what God can do. That same power, God can work in your life. I wonder where you are today. Do you feel weak? Do you feel average? But God wants to use each and every one of us in an incredible way. And in just a few moments, you, you can start that journey. Maybe you're here, maybe this is your first time, maybe you've been coming here since the church began, I don't know. But you say, Scott, I have never accepted Jesus in my life. I know about Jesus. I've been to church. But I never sat down and asked Jesus to personally come into my life. That's the first step to receiving his power by asking Jesus into your life. Can I ever have everybody has a bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around? I just want to pray for you. You just got, you're talking about power, you're talking about overcoming, you're talking about, I want what you have. God, I have never asked Jesus into my life. If you're like that, I just want to pray for you. Jesus, God, pray for me. I have never asked Jesus into my life. Father, you didn't want to know more. If anybody like that, do you pray to your hands? Anybody? Thank you. When nobody is around, how many people will they start? I do that in my 
my life. So I don't have to tell where Christ in my life. God, would you pray for me? God would start more walking in his power. Anybody got that thing to bring me there and stop praying for me? Thank you. Thank you. That's great. See this. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much for giving us your power. Thank you so much for, for you know, making us weak. Because we are all weak in some area. But by your power, we can have glory. We can have hope. We can have I pray right now that we hope we walk out of the kingdom. We hope to determine in all of our lives to walk in the power, to walk in the purpose. And we, and we like it's hard, we like it's difficult, we like it's struggle. We get to the power. Because we can have the power. We can do it. But we are the most powerful person in the world who can help you in Jesus' name. Awesome. Awesome.